Welcome to Just Asia, HRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. UN wants to strengthen ASEAN's human rights mechanism. Indian activist remains in custody despite court bail order. Defamation campaign against human rights commissioner in Nepal politically motivated. Court orders swift action against Delhi pollution. Commemoration of 1998 Simanke shooting in Indonesia. Two urgent appeals from India and Indonesia. Welcome to HRC TV's Just Asia. I'm Manny Lin. This week, Just Asia begins with the 9th ASEAN UN Summit on Monday, where United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres said the UN wants to work with the Association of Southeast Asian Nations ASEAN, to strengthen the regional bloc's human rights body. This comes as several Asian countries face human rights-related controversies. The summit host country, Philippines, has been in the global headlines due to President Rodrigo Duterte's bloody drug war that has since resulted in thousands of deaths. A military junta continues to rule Thailand. Human rights defenders are being targeted in Vietnam. There is also a crackdown on the opposition and the free press in Cambodia. Particularly troubling is Burma's violence against the Rohingya Muslim minority, which the UN has dubbed as ethnic cleansing. Secretary General Guterres said, I cannot hide my deep concern with the dramatic exit of hundreds of thousands of refugees from Burma to Bangladesh. It is a worrying escalation in the protracted tragedy and a potential source of instability in the region and radicalization. Guterres called for constructive approaches from ASEAN member states in providing humanitarian support to the minority in Rakhine. Just Asia speaks to Bijo Francis, HRC's executive director, for his thoughts on ASEAN's human rights mechanism. Well, given the uh, ASEAN human rights mechanism and its mandate and the procedures that they have set for itself, the role uh, the ASEAN human rights body can play in guaranteeing human rights uh, in the ASEAN countries is quite limited for the fact that the constitution of ASEAN human rights mechanism itself uh, calls for or requires uh, consent uh, from the member states if at all if there need to be a, a human rights uh, discussion regarding a country has to take place. That said, uh, ASEAN uh, despite all its uh, limitations, I mean the human rights body despite all its limitations, it is still a forum which can be used to highlight issues uh, in the ASEAN region, uh, even though it might take uh, a complete revisal or, or revision of the uh, <coughs> of the statute or the mandate of the ASEAN uh, human rights mechanism. Now look at the ASEAN uh, uh, states itself. At the moment we have uh, uh, quite a lot of interesting candidates, uh, starting with of course uh, Philippines where the meeting has just uh, concluded where you have an executive president who has ordered execution, that is extrajudicial execution of more than 2,700 people on the suspicion of them being involved in uh, drug trafficking. Uh, this simply means that the executive order uh, which has killed uh, this many number of people simply means that he has or the president's office has stepped over the constitutional authority of the courts and due process in the entire country. So it is, it is a means with which the state is sanctioning extrajudicial execution at large numbers, which is an alarming uh, scenario. Likewise, we have another country in the region, also a prominent one, Thailand, where uh, there are no freedoms at all which is guaranteed under the military regime which is in place in uh, Thailand. Freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, all of these foundational freedoms concerning democracy and human rights and rule of law is currently negated in Thailand. Likewise, uh, we have uh, uh, just uh, two weeks before uh, the release of the documents from the United States government which uh, exposes the massive extent of extrajudicial execution that was carried out in Indonesia. Now these are all uh, vital questions that need to be asked within the ASEAN community and I think the civil society that operates uh, that has a mandate uh, within the ASEAN uh, states also need to take up these issues seriously and start having a debate about these issues without any further delay. The Secretary General's position is quite precarious to say the least because uh, the Secretary General does not have a mandate beyond the document that constitutes the ASEAN human rights mechanism. 
and with that document itself the secretary generals and as well as the ASEAN human rights mechanisms mandate is pretty much limited so with a limited mandate it can only it can only facilitate processes with which it can expect over a period of time the expansion of its mandate uh, to create enough freedom for the ASEAN human rights mechanism to accept complaints independently and undertake investigation of these complaints independently and to take actions on known cases of gross human rights abuses. But that is a long way to go. So on one hand, uh, while the ASEAN uh, human rights mechanism in itself is a good initiative, but at the same time that initiative to be of any result or of any meaningful action the, the mandate uh, uh, of the ASEAN human rights mechanism has to be uh, expanded, if not completely rewritten. So this is uh, uh, so 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 the the secretary general's position itself is is very limited. Next, in India's Uttar Pradesh, Mr. Chandra Shekhar Ravan, the founder of the BIM Army, remains in custody despite the Allahabad High Court granting him bail in all the cases registered against him on 2nd November 2017. Ravan is in custody because the government of Uttar Pradesh has registered a case against him under the provisions of the Draconian National Security Act 1980, known as the NSA. The NSA provides for preventive detention, an act that defies the basic tenets of the rule of law and fair trial. Ironically, the authorities did not even bother with the court's reprimand while rubbishing the claims that he was primary conspirator behind the caste riots in May 2017 and calling them politically motivated. Mr. Ravan's health is rapidly deteriorating, although he was completely healthy at the time of his arrest in June 2017. Last reported, Mr. Ravan was rushed to the Lala Lajpat Rai Memorial Medical College from Saharanpur on November 8th for a stomach infection and was seen unable to walk on his own. In Nepal, a former employee of the National Human Rights Commission, Mr. Khos Raj Nupani, has authored a defamatory article against Ms. Mokhna Ansari, a current commission member with false accusations. The employee, Mr. Khos Raj, is under investigation by the Human Rights Commission for his alleged involvement in financial irregularities while he was serving in the capacity of regional coordinator. Khos Raj resigned from his position fearing prosecution. Commissioner Ms. Mokhna Ansari has undertaken a commendable job as a member of the NHRC and has best represented the institution in Nepal and abroad. The current campaign against her is aimed to put down emerging civil rights activists, particularly those from marginalized communities, and those who might have publicly expressed opinions that may not be pleasing to the incumbent government and its supporters. This maligning campaign against Mokhna Ansari is undertaken by some of the old guards of Nepal's civil society movement who have lost their relevance and interest in augmenting the human rights movement in the country. It's public knowledge that some of these former patrons have aligned themselves with the incumbent government and with the upcoming elections, their unofficial position in power could be fortified. Such a scenario could sound a death knell to emerging civil rights activists, particularly women and those from the minority communities in the country. Over the last week or so, India's capital city of New Delhi has been gripped by a severe pollution crisis. Engulfed by smog, the city saw the pollution reaching emergency levels of over 800 plus on November 8th. This week, the levels improved. According to the Central Pollution Control Board, the air quality index was 460 as of 4 p.m. on Monday, but that is still in a severe category. People in Delhi have complained of respiratory problems, burning in the eyes, and long-term health effects, such as cardiovascular diseases, and rheumatoid arthritis, and even autoimmune diseases. A severe issue of human rights, the central and state government in New Delhi have failed repeatedly to ensure a clean and healthy environment for its people. On Monday, November 13th, the Supreme Court of India issued notice to the Central Delhi, Haryana, Punjab and UP governments seeking expeditious action in the matter of crop burning, which is seen to be one of the main reasons for the severe spike in pollution. In Indonesia, Families commemorated the November 1998 Simanke shooting of students this week. 
they held a Black Thursday demonstration in front of the Presidential Palace in Jakarta and organized a public movie screening at the Jakarta Legal Aid Office. More than 19 years since former dictator Suharto stepped down in 1998, successive governments have failed to bring the case to court and prosecute the perpetrators. In fact, under current President Ridodo's government, retired Army General Viranto, who allegedly knew about the shooting committed by a subordinate, has been appointed to the cabinet. Similarly, in all this time, the Attorney General has refused to further investigate the case and also refused to bring the case before the Ad Hoc Human Rights Court as regulated by Law No. 26 of 2000. In the last two years, the Attorney General has publicly stated that the case should be brought to a non-judicial mechanism such as a reconciliation commission. The duty and obligation of the Attorney General is to investigate and prosecute violations of human rights, not to advocate reconciliation mechanisms. Finally, 13 Appeals Weekly features two cases from India and Indonesia. In West Bengal, India, police have been intimidating activists employed with human rights organization MASUM due to their reporting and data collection on violations and abuse of power by border security force personnel. In Indonesia, a workshop on access to economic, social and cultural rights for victims and family members of past human rights abuses was forcibly dispersed by an anti-communist mob. The workshop was part of an advocacy effort to seek justice. Since former dictator Suharto stepped down in 1998, Indonesia has done little to acknowledge or redress past abuses and provide adequate remedy for victims. Instead, allegations of establishing a new communist party have become a convenient excuse for forcibly dispersing various gatherings throughout the country. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia forward slash Just Asia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.